Welcome to the sixth episode of the Oral Literature podcast series. Oral Literature is a monthly public reading program held at the Terrazas branch of Austin Public Library on the last Wednesday of each month. This podcast series functions primarily to provide another medium for local writers to share their work with the public. In this episode, we will hear work from Stephanie Gearing, Fernanda Flores, Monica Teresa Ortiz, and Travis Tate, all who are reading together at the program January 25th, 2017. Up first is Travis Tate. Travis is a queer witch who writes plays and poems and performs. He's an MFA candidate at the Michener Center for Writers. His one-person show, It's a Travesty, will be featured in the Cohen New Works Festival in spring 2017. Hi, I'm Travis Tate, and I'll be reading some poems. Is this sad? Or do you mean to say, quiet down, tiny brain? Hipster haircuts are for the dogs. Leave them. Are we driving to West Texas in a rainstorm? The lightning won't strike us. It is forbidden. We'll be wearing Prada socks. I'll show you my palms. I mean surrender. I mean come away with me. I mean let's make this look like a movie. I think it would be sexy for you to floss my teeth. Call me on FaceTime. Even, even when you're just down the street. West Texas and Disney World are different things. Hope I get married in both places. Hope you'll bury your head in my crotch in both places. A quiet cowboy will tell us where to eat. He'll buy us a drink. Everyone in Texas isn't a homophobe. He tells us about love. I think about the cowboy's sons and daughters we will have. Name them August, Wolf, Epcot, Ollie. Space Mountain will be their playground. Gemini Moon. The air is feathers now, cool winged breeze, left us in a church, and yep, there's prayers. A new owl has been birthed in a sycamore tree. It has clear speech, a nominal device when speaking to humans. The owl will speak with tawny flight, here, too much, let go. Such great things are weighted in the wind, how much longer? What to let go of. The closet is still a mess. A friend is worried about the amount of beer waddling at the base of a stomach. And all this doesn't stop the church from burning down. And yes, still prayers. Gemini Moon. If you feel like you're going insane, just look up. We're waiting to bear it all in the cold December air, press genitals to the golden moon glow. Have we said enough already? The talking in your throat has made it tight, almost too many words. I'll tell you what I'm asking this supermoon. Tear me to pieces so I can make the pieces into something else. We'll all climb the superstition mountains. This is a real place. No need for oxygen. We'll just use our palms to make prayers. Stevie Nicks will be singing the hymnal. Lunatic cries three times and turns over, makes itself Latin. We'll share an American spirit. We'll want to kiss each other, not in a sexual way, but just because we are all really lonely. 12, 16, 16. In the quiet of a winter day, I wait. I've mined all the ways I could be sad and decided that I cannot do it because There's a little dog behind me tugging at my shirt. I have practiced the prayer of Janet's Rhythm Nation and now drinking tea in the evening. A voice calls to me, says ancestral dance. The samba of time is melting in the living room. I accidentally left the oven on. I think they would have melted anyway. From this view, I can see everything. The road leading to you, the restaurant that used to be a house and is far too expensive, you going into the gas station to get him a giant soda, all he wants before the bed and you, and the lighted trees, and my mother on her way home, and the leaves here spiral forever, lost in the cacophony of muscled boys and their tight shirts. Then everything is black. Now we will hear from Stephanie Gearing. Stephanie is the author of two poetry chapbooks. She's a bookseller at Austin's Malvern Books on West 29th Street. 
She also serves on the Advisory Council for Conflict of Interest, an online publication that covers Austin art and literature. You can find her online at stephaniegaring.com. Hey, I'm Stephanie Gehring, and I'm going to read four poems. The first one is called Ebb Tide. Even gravity is departure, broken surface of the water beckoning as it flees. The first time I saw death, I saw it ebbing. The Audit. Threaded with light, he threatens the horizon, half-hearted. Examine the hereafter. A sun we cannot see usurps the only sky we can. Despite examination, I learn nothing to go on. Witness. Wisdom is accumulation. I watch the body fill with snow. The dead die again in winter, no matter what I know. Energy can't be destroyed, so it grows suspicious. If at last you do succeed, invite me to the future. Each sky from memory I paint is wrong. Adam is gone, too much like the ocean. Lightning strikes, remember, are discharges, releases from service, light flashing to announce the passing, yielded cloud to cloud. Or else forget the words. Underneath my grieving, desire electrifies my hurt. Or else I am forgetting sky comes first to undertake us. Clouded by the sea, clouds perform us as enigma. Or else electric, the ocean drowns in golden light. Up next is Monica Teresa Ortiz, who was born and raised in the Texas Panhandle. Ortiz is a Macondo Fellow, the poetry editor for Raspa Magazine, which is a queer Latinx literary art journal, as well as the co-editor for Pariahs, an anthology of marginalized voices from SFA Press. My name is Monica Teresa Ortiz, and I'm going to be reading today. Uh, the first poem is called Emails. My mother miscarried. She never mentioned it to me. I could have had a sister, and I only know this family secret because my father has a loose tongue and internet access. He emailed me a truncated version of the event so that I leave pulp of my mother's uterus and the blood of my sister on the glass of a woman's skin every time I wipe my hands down her surface. One stoplight town. How do I feel things about my childhood days? Driving up Broadway Street, counting the storefronts while light, with the lights still on. I sink in thoughts of better days, like when Harmons offered prom dresses at a discount and the corn syrup plant still paid my dad a decent wage. Before it all shut down, Broadway's single stoplight sways, heavy on its wire like a decapitated head, hanging from a street in Juarez. Oh, those days of the past, when I still paid for 99 cent gas at the Red X and only dreamed of stoplights in bigger towns. Quiet. On the unmoving plains, over the smoke stack, in the evening, the mosquitoes come out singing with blood. In no time, the bites spread, and in a few seconds, your arms smeared with the tiny bodies and red. Subterfuge, almost. Mine, yours, theirs. How do you stay so silent, trapped in this pretty town? Do you only think of winter descending? You keep silent, you do not say. A crown of climate change. Originally a rooster of probability, 
on the cusp of tipping points. I cry and I spit at tornadoes in Dallas. In December, I type these words in Lubbock. There is a blizzard. I cannot crow here. Whether the weather is deconstructed or not, we do not have more time. Uh, after Sitlali died, an event horizon speaks to a black hole. A universe collapses into a cenote, spontaneous combustion into particles of blood, burning through all of my resources, especially flesh and the bottles of port chased by blackouts. There is a theory that galaxies need black holes in order to exist. There is also a theory that when a woman leaves, the force of her exit will break your bones, but you can still breathe. This is how a theory of a star dies. And the last one. After Pete Seeger died, I heard a corpse talk for free. On and on she thrust, how she moved away from Montana, and I just watched her jawbone rattle, how she'd been displaced from East Riverside by $1,600 studio apartments and arranged the relocation to cheaper spaces for the sake of survival and economics. Another time, that same night, we cast our cigarette butts onto the open casket of a fire. It was winter in Texas and she asked the name of my first love, swore me to tell her the truth. I could not say for sure, for Pete Seeger had died that day and I was just too cold to recall the first body I had ever touched. This episode ends with a short story from Fernando A. Flores. Fernando was born in Mexico and raised in South Texas. His stories and poems have appeared in various publications since 2006 and in 2014 was awarded a literary grant from the Alfredo Cisneros del Moral Foundation. Queso. Watching the news on television, Marcos yelled, that anchor's face ain't real, and hurled at an empty glass. The glass bounced off the screen and curiously neither shattered. Pissed as hell, he walked to the kitchen and brushed his teeth over the sink. Pissed as hell. It was starting to rain as he got on the bus and scanned his fake student ID to let him ride for free. At the job interview, the lady asked him to describe his talents and ambitions in the most creative, non-misogynistic way and why she should give him the job. Marcos said to her, Willie was the only other Mexican in East Kensville, and one day held a ripe red orange to a butcher's nose and made him describe the smell of the motherland on his fingers. The butcher was also Mexican, of no relation. Very good, said the lady, marking off a box on the resume. Now, hear this job. We are, we are a tightly knit community. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you describe your performance with others upon encountering a tough situation? Well, first you wring the neck of the big turkey till it flops. Then you make a soup from the rest and feed it to the others, slowly watching them eat, offering them more water and more bread greedily. Wait until afterward to bring up their sisters of the war. Sing jolly and plate the spoons. Excellent, Mr. Marcos. And using the same scale of one to 10, tell me something you think you could improve, either in your work ethic or personal integrity. There's nothing safer than a shark to ride. Take notes under the table. I'll learn the ropes, the insides, outsides of this trade. Just give me the chance and I'll have a mind for the books and to make money disappear. Piles will wheelbarrow out the back or from the bottle and you'll never know. Then I'll bring the horses in and forget about it. Give me the pies, give them. All right, Mr. Marcos. Looks like we got what we need. Thank you so much for the opportunity to interview you. We'll get back to you by the end of the day. When the boss read the application, he thought out loud to himself, All I want is to have a place where anybody can just walk right in and order a bowl of melted cheese. I will throw in some spices for flavor. It'll be served with broken up hardened tortillas. Chips, we'll call them. And people can dip the hardened tortilla chips into this melted cheese when they're having a good time. 
We'll call the cheese queso. Not pronounced Mexican, but queso. The trick I've learned from the best is that you gotta co-opt their culture, hijack it, and sell them back a cheaper version of it as an authentic experience that's better, faster than the real thing. We'll also make our version of what they call breakfast tacos and serve them around the clock. To save time, the tortillas will already be pre-made. Possibly purchased in bulk and at a discount from a provider. The eggs, they have to be already cracked in a container and poured on the grill upon getting ordered. This touch is important. It is what will let us advertise them as fresh. Every taco will also come sprinkled with cheese. Unless otherwise specified, but the standard is that every taco will be topped off with this cheese. American. And just shred it over, but pre-shredded also. The American cheese will have to be pre-shredded. Yes, that goes without saying. And this young man, he's gonna be the one grilling them. We'll start him on the graveyard shift and take it from there. That's it. Cool, that was awesome. Huh.